this episode. Fab Facts is flying high. Some musical notes in the news. Chris takes us across the pond in the randomizer. And we discuss two great British institutions with our interviewee. That's all coming up in Pod 63 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. <laughs> Pod 60 what, Jamie? Pod 63, Richard, I just said okay. it. <laughs> right, okay, So good. This, this is the Jerry Anson Podcast, <laughs> and we are your hosts. Yes, we are, Richard James and... Jamie Anderson. Oh, and here we are for the next hour and a half or so, with all the usual stuff you've come to know and love, and you might have read a very favourable review of the uh, podcast this week, which <laughs> mentioned, <laughs> I know, galling, wasn't it? Fab facts as one yeah, of yeah, his favourite like items. That. Uh, well, one of everyone's favourites, I would say, anyway. <laughs> right, so. OK. Also, other people's favourites uh, parts of the podcast, of course, is uh, Chris Dale's amazing, fabulous randomizer, which will also be joining us a little later on. We've got uh, emails from our listeners. Um, we've got some quick five fives. We've got uh, newsy news news news, of course, from the Jerry Anderson universe, because there's an awful lot going on, as we know. And the first part, I think, Jamie, of your interview this week. Yes, yeah, it's it's James Bond and Space Precinct director John Glenn. Amazing. What a coup. How yeah. was he? He was great. Went round to yeah. his house, Lovely. had a little cuddle with his doggy. Very sweet. Uh, you didn't press the red button by the dining table, did you? No, no, I kept well away from anything that could have had a double function. And did you have to step over the, sort of the laser beams in the hall and all that? And Yeah, I had to cartwheel and somersault through the laser beams <laughs> to get into the house. <laughs> it, it's only right, isn't it, that you should do that at John Glenn's house? Yeah, yeah. He's got a lovely little place. Yeah, I bet yeah. he has, yeah. Very very tidy, a very sweet little dog. But we had, oh, we had, we had a really right. nice chat. Yeah. And uh, he revealed something which I don't think many people know, but that is going to come next week. Oh. I'm going to cut the interview short. Uh, he didn't so say anything he, about my hairpiece, did he? No, it was slightly awkward when I um, yeah, mentioned oh, right. you, Richard. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's, let's move on from that bit. Richard uh, who? No, I can imagine. It was a long yeah, time ago. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> and uh, obviously we've got some Jerry Anderson news coming up too. Yeah. So it's the usual stuff. Make sure you subscribed. Yes, subscribe. No, it's quite simple. Just go to whichever platform you're listening to us on, hit the subscribe button. It simply means that you get a notification every time a new episode appears. And who would want to miss a new pod of the Jerry Anderson podcast? While you're there also, why don't you leave us a nice little review, um, hit the star rating as well, you know. Give us a nice little four or five. That'd be very much appreciated. And, of course, share us with your friends so they can join in the fun as well. Because no one wants to miss out, do they? Now, I put a request out last week, didn't I, for people to share the podcast with other people and let us know yeah. if they managed to get us any new listeners. Did you get any nothing about that? From the anybody? tumbleweed blew past, I think, at some point. No, that just a bit it. tumbleweed. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Podstrons. If this week you'd like to share the podcast <laughs> with a friend or colleague or stranger on a bus, please do and let us know you've done so. <laughs> you can email us with that or anything else at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Yeah, that's right. You can do all the above all at once. Now, Richard, I've got a slight problem in that I actually completely forgot about Quickfire 5 this week. Oh, Jamie! So I'm going to have to try and put it together. I thought I saw a look of panic in your eyes when I mentioned it. Yeah, the slight widening there. Oh, no! Mm. So I'm going to try and put it together through this podcast, uh, but we may end up with just one Quickfire 5 this week. <laughs> no, not already! Here we go! Right, you're straight in. Now, this time, I'm pulling rank on this week's Quickfire 5, Jamie. Are you ready for this? Okay. Terra Hawks captains, Captain Mary Faulkner or Captain Kate Kestrel? Oh, Mary, because it's based on my mummy. Ah! Stingray lieutenants, Lieutenant Atlanta Shaw or Sub Lieutenant John Horatio Fisher? Oh, come on, Atlanta Shaw. <laughs> Captain Scarlet captains, Captain Ochre or Captain Magenta? Uh, Magenta for fun. <laughs> UFOs colonels, Colonel Virginia Lake or Colonel Paul Foster? Oh, so I have to stick with um, Mumba Batch. It's, yes, uh, you do. Really. It's one of them, yeah. Of Virginia course. Lake. And finally, how well do you know your Space Precinct guest police officers? Predator and Prey's Officer Walker or the witnesses, Officer Morgan? <laughs> Blank looks Mor all around. Morgan? <laughs> Great. What did you particularly like about Officer Morgan? The name. <laughs> 
You see, I would have gone for the walker there. He was the one that turned into or carried the um, Enil Kamada. He was the host of that kind of parasitic vampire oh, okay. alien that I played. Oh, that, who was that okay. act then? Rolf What's Saxon. He was, he was in quite a lot of other stuff, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. well, he was like Lou Hirsch, really. He was sort of rent yank wasn't he? It's and Shane Rimmer, by his own admission, even though, you know, <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> yeah, he did very well, Rolf Saxon. I really like that term, rent yank It's great. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, that's my quick fire five out of the way. So we look forward to yours, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to go very well. Anyway, thank you for that, Richard. Much appreciated. Hey, Shall we go straight into fab facts then? Oh, right. OK, let's have some fab facts. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. I think we're going to try the book again, Richard. We, oh. we are running thin, but I've got a backup fact just in case the book doesn't ah, come good. Have you? But let's try. Listeners, if you're new to this segment, where have you been? You've been yeah. missing out. I've got a book of Fab Facts, which uh, has been climbing up the Amazon book charts because yes. of our lovely posturons buying copies of it, even though it hasn't been <laughs> out right. for 18 years or something. Yeah. I'll flick through the book. Richard will shout Fab. We'll pick a random fact from whatever spread we land on and discuss it, debunk it, whatever. Simple as that. Sounds fun? Well. Sounds like a thing? It certainly sounds like a thing. <laughs> then let's give it a go, Richard. Are you ready with your fab? Born ready. Here's the book. Fab. Uh, we are oh. on. Yes. The spread of page 40 and 41. Okay. Oh, okay. Now this is, I really like this one, Richard. I'm going to slightly risk ourselves by inserting a very short musical clip of this as well. What, now? No, after I've said what the fact is. Oh, right, okay. So, Richard, you know, obviously, things like Fire Black Cell 5 and Stingray, for example. You know those shows, yeah? yeah. And you know the end credits? Yeah. They had a a sung theme, right? Yes, they did. A song, I think they're called. I think (laughs) it's what it's called, yes. Music with words delivered tunefully over the top to the melody. (laughs) Yeah, they had songs. Now, Thunderbirds, of course... At the, oh. the iconic Thunderbirds march. But yeah. did you know that Barry Gray did actually compose an end theme song for Thunderbirds? He did not. What, to the tune that we all know and love? No, oh. not to the tune, but to yeah. another tune. Right. Which was slightly less successful. It was actually called Flying High. Oh, yes. And I think we can hear a little clip of it right now. So, did they um, make the right choice by not including that, Richard, do you think? Was that ever seriously considered? Yes! It was. Yeah, well, mm. they got into the, the thing of it. You know, Supercar had a, a song. Yeah, yeah. Five Black Cell 5. Yeah. Stingray, you know, all very successful. See. They think they'd gone into the charts, so they thought, well, obviously. I mean, had that happened, of course, we would all be talking about it as if it had been a thing for the last 50-odd years, wouldn't we? And would be saying what a dreadful mistake it was to have that song as the closing credits, and or would we all be used to it and just I know, it's, singing it's, along? It's, it's such a weird contrast yeah. to the iconic Thunderbirds march, isn't it? Yes. I, I don't think it would have worked. Well. But I, I wonder who made the decision. I wonder, you know, whether it was seriously discussed, almost made it, or whether Barry presented it. Yeah. And they instantly went, oh. No. Put that to <laughs> one Barry. side. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, I wouldn't say that was a misfire, but not one of Barry Gray's strongest songs. No, and that's okay, though, isn't it? Of course, you know, genius is is not a constant thing, is it? I mean, we know, don't we, Jamie? (laughs) We we occasionally struggle through a a podcast or something else. But but also, we've discussed Candy and Andy in previous weeks as a creative misfire for Dad and the team. You know, go back and listen to that fab fact from a few weeks ago. Yeah, that's right. Most bizarre. But yes, Mm. I think it's probably a good thing that that didn't end up being the closing theme song for Thunderbirds. I think uh, you're probably right, yeah. Because it would have diluted the impact of that fantastic march. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. Great. Well, next time I look forward to... Who, who wrote the theme tune, the uh, series two of Space 1999? Derek Wadsworth. <laughs> well, I look forward to his um, closing credit uh, song that you've uncovered for next week's fan Well, facts. if only. But that was... that's <laughs> another, We've discussed this before. It's another one where the melody is written to uh, sound yes. like the title. That's right, yes. Anyway... That's to be saved for another week. Hooray! But for now, that's the end of this week's... Song Fact! 
Nice. There you well go. found. Is I mean that? Did you just go to YouTube and find that little uh, clip, or is it uh, harder to find? I had to go searching for quite some time yeah. actually in the end. Yeah. Gosh. So there. there we go. Well, Barry would thank you for that, wouldn't he? Um, <laughs> probably not. Probably mm. not. I mean, what a genius! And you know, it probably that song would sound better out of context if we didn't already know the Thunderbirds march and all those. Other That's things. right. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So there we are. You're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Uh, don't forget, you can email us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll be reading out some of our listener emails uh, a little later on. We've got Chris Dell's Randomizer still ahead. Part one of Jamie's interview with uh, James Bond and Jerry Anderson director John Glenn. And also, of course, you can contact us on Twitter. Just hashtag us Jerry Anderson podcast and you can tag him. I'm Jamie Anderson or me, Richard N. James, and we will see your tweets there. Yes, mm. please do those things. Mm. And, you know, I've, I've already said it, and I said it last week, and nobody did it, but please do share the podcast with a friend yeah, or takes, a colleague moments, or yeah. a stranger. That's right. Or just tweet about it or yeah. post about it on your Facebook page or something. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate it because our listeners' numbers are always climbing. In fact, Richard, yes. I did send you a thing this week, didn't I? We've been sat in the top five Apple podcast TV and film, and film. charts yeah. Yeah. for the whole week. Amazing. We were number two behind Chernobyl for a bit. Amazing. Crazy. Yes. Crazy. So yeah. thank you to all of you for listening in. And for yeah, there must be some very poor stuff. competition out there, mustn't there? That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing competition. I mean, yeah. we're up there with uh, Mark Kermode and... Yeah. Yeah, plenty Who of other... thought? It's amazing. And even actually, we're ranking slightly higher than the Stranger Things official Netflix Arley. podcast currently. <laughs> I don't know how that's happened. Wow. <laughs> no. Ready for a fall, I think. <laughs> of course, yes, exactly. Richard, would you like some Jerry Anderson news? Because that keeps people coming back. Well, is there any Jerry Anderson news? There's a little bit. Let's hear it. Newsy, news, news, news. Uh, I was just waiting for you to say that. I know. There it we are. feel the same unless you do. Oh. Yeah, it's the Jerry Anderson news. And uh, I think after last week's news and sort cool. of the stuff that we hinted at the previous week, it's okay to have a slightly lighter news week, isn't oh, it? I think that's fair enough, yes. And that's what we're giving you. So um, <laughs> we've already talked about the UFO soundtrack release from Silver Screen. Lovely. It's coming on CD and vinyl. Oh, beautiful pink uh, vinyl. Cool. I think it's purple, actually, Richard. Well, you say purple, I say pink. Let's call the whole thing off. Mm, okay, fine. Bye. Uh, no, so that is coming and it's being launched on the 13th of September. Move. All right, fine, move. Mm. But we read the Lavender. silver script. Richard, thank Sorry. you. Yes, fine. Lavender, Lavender vinyl, lovely. What a lovely colour. <laughs> we read in the silver screen press release something which hints at other soundtracks to come. What? Now, the press release basically says that UFO is the first in a series of new Barry Gray soundtrack releases uh -huh. from which we are inferring that yeah. other Jerry Anderson soundtracks by Barry Gray are still to come. Yeah. So perhaps Space 1999, cool. Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet, Stingray, Fire Black Cell 5, Joe 90. <laughs> All of those and others may be on their way. And well, that well. is very exciting. Now, that's not confirmed. No. But... The headline in the press release definitely suggests it. I'm going to ask Silver Screen if they want to comment further. But yes. That's rather exciting. That's great. Any particular ones you're looking forward to, Richard? Any ones you'd really like to listen to in the car, perhaps, when you're going away on holiday or something? Oh, it's like got to be Thunderbirds, is not it? It's got to be the, It's got to be that iconic theme. Really? You want the Thunderbirds oh. soundtrack? Oh, if you're in a car, absolutely. I mean, when I was doing Space Precinct, somehow I had a cassette of the theme tune, and Charlotte and I used to put that in our car as we drove off. Because <laughs> it just puts you in the mood. And Thunderbirds would be exactly the same. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it does. Anyway, that's very exciting. And uh, we'll look forward to those. Yeah. We've got some Space 1999 merch on the way, Richard. I bet you have. Well, in fact, there's two exciting tranches of Space <laughs> 1999 merch. Are there? Just giving it an international flavour now. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> there's a couple of great designs out this week. A Japanese-inspired Commander Koenig T-shirt design. Oh, right. Which is pretty cool. In what way Japanese inspired? Well, it's got some Japanese lettering on it. There's oh, a bit of a trend of recently. <laughs> yes, it's an origami t-shirt. No, <laughs> there's a bit of a trend recently for stuff with Japanese lettering on it, which I've seen in the shops and various yeah. bits and pieces. And we're working with a new designer called Gordon Tate, actually, yeah. who's done this. It's really, really lovely. Cool. Um, Chris Thompson has done a fantastic Space 1999 illustration featuring one of the Alphans in a space suit and an eagle in the background. And it's, it's really smart. Right. And it looks particularly good on a black mug. Does it? So, 
It really does, actually. I'll, yeah. I'll send you it. You're definitely going to love that. <laughs> so keep an eye out for that. But also, if you're in the US, we know there are lots of Space 1999 fans in the US. Mm-hmm. Eh? And so uh, we wanted to do something for you because it can get quite expensive shipping stuff over from the UK. And uh, I know it's a bit distracting having stuff on the Jerry Anderson store in pounds sterling, but yeah. perhaps you're in US dollars and all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. There is a currency changer on the Jerry Anderson store, but this is exclusive news. <laughs> We're launching a Space 1999 store. Oh, online, really? Yeah. Probably sometime later this week or early next week. Right. The web address for it is space1999.store. Oh, I like it. <laughs> and uh, there'll be all the good stuff you know from the Jerry Anderson store featuring Space 1999 uh, logos and all that kind of stuff. But there are lots of new exclusive ranges coming to that store. Oh, lovely. If you order it in the US, stuff will be dispatched from the US for the most part. And if you order it in the UK or elsewhere in the world, it'll be dispatched from our EU warehouse and manufacturing location. So great. You can still order it if you're outside the US, but yeah. it's got a bit of a US focus. So that's yeah. quite exciting, isn't it? Yeah, that's really exciting. I like that. Yeah. Nice. And finally, for our little bit of news today, yeah. uh, Chris Dale's written a rather nice article about the Super Space Theatre compilations of the 1980s. Oh, of course he has. <laughs> it's how he spends his time. He's done a seriously in-depth review of Yeah, them, I bet. And definitely worth it. So if you ever enjoyed things like Countdown to Disaster and uh, Cosmic Princess, etc., etc., go and have a read of those. Yes. Um, there's also loads of new stuff on the YouTube channel. Ross has been working hard there, releasing various bits and pieces, doing us some nice new thumbnails. Some right. Nice new thumbnail art. It just looks really nice. It's, it's, yeah. And it's all coming together. We've added. Does it like, come off with a bit of a nail polish remover, though? I'd be a bit concerned that it would go. Uh, you know, does it stain or does it come off all right? Oh, uh, Richard. No? It was all going so well. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, do pop over to the YouTube channel, Jerry Anson TV, and uh, enjoy what's there. Get lost in the Jerry Anson wormhole for a bit. Yes. That's and probably right. we'll end up skipping from video to video. Yeah. But for now, Richard, I think that is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news, that was the news. <laughs> Ooh, Thank you that very was much. Almost, I was worried that was never going to end. <laughs> <laughs> That's put five minutes on the podcast, isn't it? Well, we're running a bit short, actually, this week. Yeah, uh, listen, actually, I have to say, Jamie, I sort of, quite by accident, stumbled across the Jerry Anderson website this week, and I've noticed there's a little addition that you can actually listen to the podcast from the website. It just yes. a little kind of thing appears at the bottom of the screen with a little play button, yeah. and you can listen as you browse. Yeah, yeah, there's Nicely a smart, smart player at the bottom there, because yeah. sometimes it's actually quite nice to listen while yes. browsing, and if you're on a desktop, or I think you can do it from mobile too, you can... yeah. You know, enjoy reading and listening at the same time. There really is no escape, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Sorry about and that. And you wonder why we're in the top five of the charts. Because no one can get away from us. Mm, that's true. If they turn <laughs> to the website, they've got to listen. If they go on the yeah. YouTube channel, they've got to listen. If yeah. they go Soon we'll on the uh, podcast, yeah, yeah. there. Piping into everyone's homes as they wake up in the morning. That's what we're heading for, isn't it? <laughs> that would be the ideal, I think. <laughs> yeah, I just imagine, off. I imagine you and me at letterboxes. You know, shouting through. It's the Jerry Anderson podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Morning. <laughs> As we get arrested. Yes. Uh, anyway, Richard, have you got a top five or something in terms of tweets just so I can quickly work on my uh, yeah, top five? I have actually. Yeah, people have been getting in touch on Twitter. They've been hashtagging Jerry Anderson podcast and tagging I am Jamie Anderson or me, Richard N. James. So I have compiled a little list of the top five tweets of the week. Five. Firstly, Alan J. Porter tweeted a picture of his UFO collection, including a Shadow Mobile and Skydiver 1, and said, My little geek heart skipped a beat with the arrival of these today. At least we can now be sure that the movie room display cabinet will be safe from alien invasion. He has a movie room. Woo! Four. James tweeted, In the week we revealed a reboot of Terrorhawks was on the way, just realised my work colleague has the phone extension 1010. Ooh. Three. Thunderbird Fury tweeted, hashtag when you weren't looking, someone turns off the Jerry Anderson podcast. How dare they? Two. Simon Allen, otherwise known on Twitter as Bad Pun Guy, tweeted, great email to the Benji and Nick show praising the Jerry Anderson podcast. But then he would, because he wrote it. One. And finally, the Jerry Anderson TV Twitter account asked, what was your favourite part of this week's Jerry Anderson podcast with Kevin Grazier? To which Kevin Grazier responded, all of it. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say Kevin Grazier responded, 
the Kevin Kevin Graves Graves, review. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, do listen back to that two-part interview. It's gone down a storm. People really enjoyed that with Kevin Graves, a planetary scientist, and uh, to hear his thoughts, not just on the Jerry Anderson world, but on on science in general and his his journey through his uh, chosen field, all thanks to being a fan of the of the shows Space 1999 and so on back in the day. It's great. It's incredible, isn't it? And the fact that we can switch from planetary physicist to James Bond director. Yes. Uh, without so much as a breath. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and also, that's, that's a thought I had about the two bits of news we've had recently, the, the Space 1999 audio series and Big Finish and the Terra Hawks reboot in the works. There, in a nutshell, you've got the real breadth of the Jerry Anderson universe. I mean, you've got this rather worthy, serious bit of sci-fi from the 1970s and something not quite so worthy and serious from the 1980s. <laughs> it, all from the same stable and all getting a bit of a, a dust down and uh, a bit of a reboot for the 21st century. It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. I can't believe you described Terror Orcs as not so worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's just say they didn't take it quite so seriously, did they? Well, no, but it improved when they stopped taking it so seriously, which yeah. is one of, the, one of the highlights of Terror Hawks, actually. Yeah, yeah. If you can get past those opening two episodes, right. and when it starts to find its comedy feet, yeah. that's, that's when you can really enjoy Terror Hawks. Great. Very good. I've now got four of my five quick fire fire. Oh, almost there. Mm, yeah. I suppose it might help if we uh, open the door and let in... Uh, oh, no, not again. Don't... Oh. I've only just got the place warm, Jamie. Oh, no! Oh. This is the voice of the Podsterons. Now, I always feel like I'm being enveloped by a warm blanket when we get into the voice of the Podsterons. Do you? More like a well, wet sponge. <laughs> <laughs> it's the content of the emails that makes oh, me feel I warm see. and fuzzy. Oh, I see, yes. Of uh, course. And we've got three hand-picked Podsteron emails this week that I think are going to uh, at least give us a little bit of a smile. Yeah, exactly. I have one here from uh, Alex Sampson. Shall I dive in? I would love you to. Well, now, Alex says, hello again, Jamie. No. I mean, okay, fine. Hi, Alex. Yeah, uh, yeah, all right. I'll just uh, close the door on my way out, shall I? Now, this week's fab facts on Captain Scarlet reminded me, says Alex, of another fact about the show, which I think is pretty interesting. Now, according to the complete book of Captain Scarlet by Chris Bentley... Jerry Anderson's first treatment for a follow-up to Thunderbirds was a cop show, where halfway through the series, the lead character would get killed and replaced. Killing a main character had never been done at the time, and Jerry felt convinced it would keep audiences on the edge of their seats. But Lou Grade discouraged him from doing it, going as far as to tell him, you need your head examined, you can't kill the main character. This prompted Jerry to rethink and thought, rather than killing them off, they could be killed every episode and somehow be brought back to life every time. And thus, the premise for Captain Scarlet was born. And that's from Alex Sampson. Cheers, Alex. Yeah, I didn't know that. It's interesting. Well, I know nice that story. Dad had a fascination with the idea of killing off the main cast. Main characters, you know, Making yeah. it a surprise so that you never know. You never really are sure that you're... Yeah beloved character is going to survive from week to week well that's very current isn't it i mean you look at things like the bodyguard and all the you know the big dramas at the moment you really don't know who's safe and who isn't that's part of the jeopardy isn't it but i've got two unfinished anderson treatments where that exact thing happens right and they're they're both really interesting really cool yeah Ah. so uh yeah he's on record quite a few times as saying he he would have really loved to have done that and but you know that was back in the 60s it wasn't done then yes that's right Extremely forward thinking. Absolutely right, yes. I suppose we then had things like, um, oh, what was the um, uh, Randall and Hopkirk deceased, of course, so the main character dies in the first episode, but obviously he's then in the entire it's series. So is then there forever. Slightly yeah. different, yeah. 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 Thanks, Alex. Mm. And thank you, Richard. No, well, thanks, yeah. Shall I go now? <coughs> no, no, don't worry, because the next one oh. does address you. Oh, well, that's um, nice, isn't it? Next email's from Matthew Alden Harris. I hope he puts our, my name uh, first. Regular writer. Um, mm. I can do that. Hello, Richard and Jamie. Is that what he says? Well, no, I just changed it. Uh, thank you for another fab podcast. First of all, I kept my promise I made to Richard at the Space Centre and watched some Space Precinct. Ah, oh, right. There Good. You go. That's nice. I started by watching the episodes that feature on the randomizer. I've now seen quite a few and think it's absolutely terror. Uh, brilliant. Oh, 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 absolutely terror hawks. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> and Orin. Mm. Mm. is my favourite character already. Oh, shit. You suck up, Get away. Whoa, brown nose. I'm also really excited about the Terror Hawks reboot. Yes. I look forward to hearing more about it. Well, so does Richard, I can tell you. Yeah, oh, yeah. (laughs) I thought you might like to know that I just got back from camp in Somerset, 
where I went with my church, and on one of the days we did a rocket making, and I made Thunderbirds one and three. Oh wow! When they were launched, both rockets soared up into the sky and went really high. Luckily, both returned to Earth safely. <sighs> that's good news. Yeah, that's great. Also, while in the arts and crafts room, I made a Thunderbird 1 keyring, a Spectrum logo tree decoration, and drew a picture of Thunderbird 2. Lovely. We also had an evening entertainment talent section, and my talent that was I could name all 32 episodes of Thunderbirds and the two films from memory. Oh. Nice work. <laughs> I got a round of applause when I finished. Yes, I should think so. Finally... I went to the last night party dressed as the indestructible Captain Scarlet. Crumbs. He's attached some pictures of the stuff he's made, which look fantastic. Yeah. So, well done, Matthew. Very nice. And uh, he says, best of luck with Firestorm, Terror Hawks, and Space 1999. F A B S I G and P W O R. Lovely. Yeah. Isn't that great? What's fantastic about that, of course, is that this raises all sorts of questions in people's minds, don't they? When they see you drawing a picture of Thunderbird 2 or when you're making a cosplay or uh, you're making a little Spectrum logo tree decoration, people are going to say, what are you doing? And that opens up a whole conversation, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, Jerry Anderson. Oh, I know Jerry Anderson. Yeah, Unless, unless they don't know, of course. Yeah, Jerry Which does happen occasionally. Oh, rarely, I should imagine. Yeah, it's, it is rare, actually. But every time I think, oh, yeah, everybody knows it because I'm yes. like, cautious for a while, somebody goes, no, no, never right. heard that. And wow. then I'm cautious for like the next six months going, you may not know, but... And yeah. Of course I know. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. And I go through this perpetual cycle. Anyway, yes. Matthew, thank you. Keep up the good work and yeah. uh, keep dressing as Captain Scarlet. Absolutely. He's sort of doing our job for us there, isn't he? Matthew Alderman Harris. That's the sort of name where the middle name should really be his first name and it would be a nice little... Uh... Alderman Matthew Harris. It makes him sound much more important, doesn't it, I think? <laughs> anyway, uh, now look, what on earth is going on here? Because Chris Aston has got in touch. Chris Aston says, Dear Jamie. Well, no, I'll tell you why, because this was not sent to the podcast, but I right. thought it was interesting based on recent news. That's why. Yes, yes. Now, he's been... Uh, getting uh, certain missives from you, hasn't he, and the Jerry Anderson store, because he says, thank you for the email showing appreciation for my second order with you. Nice touch. So that's Pleasure. nice, isn't it? People getting little bit, bits and pieces for shopping online with the Jerry Anderson store. Um, on the subject of appreciation, he says, I know you get lots of nice comments about the legacy from your dad's work, but I really wanted to add my own to you personally. Sorry, this is so long. Right, ready for this? That's why I've given it to you, you see, Richard. Great. I was born in October 1965, so, so like so many people of my age, these shows were the perfect backdrop to my young, fertile imagination. As I approach 54... I want you to know that for some of us, this backdrop never fades. When I look at the moon at night, I still feel the exact same feelings. Alpha is still up there. The Mistrons are out there somewhere also. And I go into a forest and I can imagine seeing a shadow mobile. I'm mostly considered sane, normally. I'm constantly surprised how strong this emotion is and what a satisfying, evocative, warm and strangely comforting feeling it is. People exclusively female, I think, although some would beg to differ there, Chris, may think this is silly. Maybe so, but it feels so good to me personally. It feels it is 20% of who I am. Your dad will be so proud of how you've continued and protected his rich legacy. Just like Giles Martin's remastering of the Beatles master tapes, all your current work will be appreciated well into the future, I'm sure. I hope you feel this way too. FYI, he continues, I also wanted to say that I really hope the sales figures for the new Space 1999 audiobook are good. I must admit to you, I have longed for some sort of Space 1999 reboot, but strangely, when this was announced, I felt a surge of, I know the breakaway story, I know these characters so well. I felt a kind of guilt that they were somehow about to be replaced or pushed aside. I felt sad. Maybe I shouldn't buy this audiobook? Just ignore it? My Space 1999 is already on my shelves, and more importantly, already in my heart. 24 hours of confused self-debating later, and I'd come out the other side completely. It's not being replaced. It's still there. Nothing can erase it. I'm ready for this. With your supervision, this is the chance for the story to be updated and perfected. Suddenly, I feel like it's the mid-70s and I'm 10 again. I've heard a clip. Sounds great, and I can't wait. With some expensive headphones and a dark room, my imagination is being fired up again in a way I thought it never would. Thank you, Jamie, for that. I say all this because there must be a lot of people like me who may initially feel strangely resistant. I'm guessing by the time of audiobook two or three, they won't be able to resist any longer. With the original strong imagery burnt into our brains, mixed with intelligent, sophisticated adult scripts, supervised by yourself, this, I feel, will be the real Space 1999. Maybe the original will, in my mind, even become my forever beloved, yet now, rough sketch, prototype TV version. Either way, thank you. With regards, Chris Aston. 
Well, there we are. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I'm sure there are a few Jerry Anderson fans out there who've gone through a similar journey over the last week, actually. Absolutely. Well, this is why I thought it was really interesting yeah. to include because, yeah. you know, well, obviously with the special edition selling out and yes. it's news spread like wildfire, it's been very popular with yeah. the audio series. There have been some people, and understandably, it's fair enough, yep. who've said, mm, I don't want to do this because I know the original stuff. I like mm. the original characters. They can't be replaced. But that's the thing. We're not here to replace them. No, they can't be replaced. That's right. Yeah. Why would we even try that? And that's what Chris has really nicely um, sort of illustrated here. Yeah. Is that whatever happens, those originals are there and they are the basis. Yeah. You know, they, they are the root of everything we're doing now. Yeah. So everything is done with a huge amount of love to pay homage to it and to yeah. kind of take it to the next level. Yeah. That's right. And so, yeah, so I was just really, really pleased to see that. No, that's reason. really good. So if and you're also... feeling a bit reluctant, mm. then, you know, do what Chris did and have a little think about the fact that we're not trying to replace it. It's yeah. just it's just an extension. It's an offshoot. It's the, That's it's right. A, it's a new thing to add to the world of Space 1999, not to replace it. Absolutely. That's right. And I suppose the basic question is, do you want new Space 1999? And if so, well... This is the only way we can do it. Here it is. <laughs> That's right. You know, a lot of those guys aren't around anymore. We don't, you know, there, there isn't going to be a new TV series in production that we know of yet. Yeah. This is the only way it can be done. So if you want new adventures with the Alphans, then this is the only way to do it, isn't it? Yeah. And and they've already done a fantastic job, as, as I've said. You know, it, it sounds great. Everyone yeah. who's heard it so far loves it. And, you know, there's new stories and reimagined old ones to come. Yeah, great. And also stuff to build out that world, which is yeah. quite exciting. You That's know? right. Again, Nick Briggs and I have been discussing various things to... I'm sure you have. To make the world more interesting and involved yeah. and yeah. evolving. And uh, right. I think those are going to work really well. So there yeah. you go. That's great. Thank Very good. So if you have a question uh, or a comment or remark or thought or even a little muse or a, a little uh, nugget at the back of your mind that you just want to share with the rest of us, <laughs> then you can send it into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll try our best to read it out next time. Also, I have to mention the Facebook group. Have we got time for me to read out a few of these? or should we, Oh, um... please do. Yeah. Now, if you're on Facebook, and I know not everybody is, and of course that's fine, but if you're on Facebook, Facebook and you want to join our podcast listeners group, just head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons and you can join in the fun there. For example, Phil Steer, who we all know and love, is uh, sharing his Thunderbirds cross sections. Tom Hodden is asking members to post gifts of Office Orange's new partner. And there's also a discussion about how the font for the new James Bond film title reveal is exactly the same as that used in Space 1999's This Episode trailers. Yeah. But Simon White says, thinking how Funko Pops have recently released their vinyls of Lady Penelope, or Panelope as they've called her, Parker and Brains, I always thought that Eagle Moss should release a collector series dedicated to the ships and vehicles of the universes of Jerry Anderson in the same way they did with the ships of the Star Trek universe. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I think we tweeted the editor of the Eagle mm -hmm. Moss collection, and he said, if the tweet gets 1,500 retweets, then we'll do it. Right. It didn't get 1,500 retweets. <laughs> yeah, okay. There but it's on their radar, yeah. so you never know. No, that's right. Lovely thought. Chris Baker, this is nice. Hi, all. Pod 61 was my first ever listen. And having just completed 62, just thought I'd say how much I've enjoyed it. It struck a particular chord listening to the interview with uh, Dr. Kevin Grazier. My interest in science was sparked by the Anderson shows of my youth, leading to a 30-year career as a science teacher, influencing and enthusing generations of future scientists in turn. All good stuff. Brilliant. Ian Kumar says... So I'm getting back into the Jerry Anderson podcast after a fair few months away. Sorry, Jamie and Richard. Mm. And I'm trying to figure out how to go back and listen to the ones I've missed. Do I do it chronologically, but then forwards or backwards or by interviewee? And I was also wondering, is there a list of which episodes are covered in the randomizer for each pod to help me to decide that way? To which Chris Dale replied, yes, actually, I've just added a list to the Jerry Anderson website and I'll try to update it every week. So if you go to jerryanderson.co.uk forward slash podcast forward slash randomizer hyphen selections, you will see in order of appearance all the episodes that Chris has reviewed for the randomizer. So there we are. All that has been going on and much more. Uh, they've been having watch parties. I joined them on Friday night to watch uh, Doppelganger, which was fun. I think this week they're doing an episode of uh, Space Precinct, which I can't be there for because I'll be away for the weekend. Oh, what a shame, uh, Richard. So yes, uh, it's rather nice. Uh, Friday night get-together. All fun and games. Yeah, lovely. Oh, yeah. I'm, really, I'm glad it's all going so well over of there. Of course it is. Lovely so, bunch of people. Uh, if you're listening and you're already a member, then head over to facebook.com slash groups slash and uh, yeah. answer the three questions. Uh, yes. For goodness sake. I know, some people are still not doing that. Yeah, there are three questions. 
Not yep. just one. Yeah. Make sure you answer all three, and then Richard, Gatekeeper yeah. James, yes. will let you in. And then you can join in the fun. But it's such a lovely atmosphere, lovely vibe. Yeah. Uh, friendly place to hang out and share your thoughts on Jerry Anderson. Yeah, the lovely review that uh, I think we both sort of retweeted this week also remarked on our lovely, friendly community that accompanies the podcast. So that was a very nice thing for him to say. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. There are lots of lovely people who have worked with Dad over the years, as well as the fans. Yes. And one of those lovely human beings... Oh, Jamie, is, please. <laughs> another of those lovely human <laughs> beings is director John Glenn. Yes. Now, John, particularly around the time of Space Precinct, which is when he and Dad kind of got back together as, as friends, and we'll mm. hear from John in the, in the interview how they met originally, which is quite mm. interesting. John spent a lot of time visiting the house uh, with his lovely wife, Janine, and I've got some very kind of fond memories. And John's got a really lovely kind of tone to his voice, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he really has. A real kind of paternal warm yes. thing, which uh, really always made me feel right at ease as a kid. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, older, important people can be a bit scary when you're Yeah, a little intimidating, yeah. Uh, yeah, but no, I had a great chat with John. The really nice thing is when I asked him to introduce himself, he basically just went off and then did the whole career <laughs> chat. Uh, I, I didn't have to ask him anything. Now, right. as I said, in part two, John is going to reveal something which I'm pretty sure not very many people know, which mm. I was very pleased to hear about. Mm. But this, the first half of the interview is great. He tells us all sorts of stuff about how he got into working with Bond, stuff about Space Precinct, working with Ted Shackelford and Rob Youngblood. Oh, yeah. How annoying it was working with the prosthetics. Not oh, yeah. the people under them, Richard. No. The actual prosthetics <laughs> <Sure>. themselves. <laughs> and all sorts of other stuff. Really, really interesting about how he got into the industry from the early days. And uh, you can really feel where John got his love of action from and that what made him such a great action director yeah so without further ado shall we hear from bond director and space precinct director john glenn oh yes please here he is then i'm john glenn i'm probably best known for directing james bond movies i did all the bond films of the 80s all five of them starting with uh, for your eyes only and uh, ending up with uh, license to kill with timothy dalton uh, I worked largely with Roger Moore, who was an absolute delight to work with, and uh, Timothy, very, very professional, although he had a lot to live up to with uh, Roger in a sense, because Roger was uh, a laugh a minute and he was very relaxed, and uh, Timothy was a Shakespearean actor and had, was slightly different in his demeanour, shall we say. But nevertheless, he brought his own character to the Bond movies which we encouraged, you know. It was, we sort of wrote and adapted the scripts to fit Timothy to get away from the more flippant type of <laughs> bonds that we are doing with Roger. I did a talk recently and uh, I said, you know, I said how much I admired Roger more. I said, the only problem is I don't think anyone can imagine Roger killing anyone. <laughs> <laughs> he was such a nice guy. <laughs> so uh, he certainly was quite different to Sean Connery. And Sean Connery, you could imagine, could kill someone. <laughs> Fantastic, John. So people will obviously know you for those bits and pieces, but could you just take me back to early days? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? And in sort of a couple of minutes, how did you get into the industry? Yeah, it's strange, really, because um, I was a Second World War child, if you like. I was seven when the Second World War started. And uh, life was a great adventure for us kids during the war. We had absolutely no fear whatsoever. And uh, we survived all the bombing raids and what have you. I remember my dad, when the bombing started, uh, he said, uh, no bloody Germans are going to get me out of my bed. And then the bomb started falling. And uh, when they got really close, he said, follow me. And we rushed downstairs to uh, an improvised air raid shelter in the cellar. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was a lesson to me, but uh, it was all excitement uh, in a way. I had three sisters. Uh, I was educated at the local elementary school, and I left school at 14. And uh, I went over to Nettlefold Studios at Warden on Thames to apply for a, a job as a messenger boy. Unfortunately, I was a big lad, and the uniform didn't fit me, so I didn't get the job. But uh, the commissioner sent me over to Shepparton Studios where he had a friend at the gate and they very kindly uh, 
took my name and address. No one had phones in those days, or very few people had phones. And uh, I received a letter and went for an interview, and I became one of about 20 messenger boys at Shepparton Studios, which was a much bigger studio. And that was really my induction into the film industry. I hadn't really had any great thoughts. I was a great film lover. I love films, but I never thought I'd ever get a job in films. I like to think now that um, if I'd gone into banking or something else, I would have done just as well, I think. Because you're just that type of person. Well, I, I was... I was, I was very ambitious and uh, I got on, I had a nice personality, if you like, as a young person. And very importantly, I got on with older people very well. I had respect for older people and um, they seemed to like me and wanted to help me. Fantastic. It's probably something that you hear all the time now, especially in the, in the industry, is be nice to everyone. Well, uh, yeah, the old story precious. is, you know, uh, on the way up... Uh, you'll see them on the way down, you know. Yeah. And it's certainly very true of the film industry. I mean, you know, I, had a, I was very fortunate. I had a good grounding in the editing side of films. Eventually, after many, many years, becoming a, a film editor. In fact, uh, I met your father, Jerry Anderson, when we were both sound editors. And uh, I think Jerry was slightly more successful at it than I was, but I don't know. <laughs> but I did, I did my stint as a sound editor. And uh, eventually, I became an editor. Uh, and I didn't really see Jerry too much over the years. And he, of course, went into the puppet business and formed his own company with Sylvia. And they made a great success of the puppet series. And uh, eventually, I think, uh, Lou, Lou Grade bought Jerry out, I think. And, uh, and back in 61. Probably one of the biggest mistakes Jerry ever made. <laughs> he, he often lamented that, John, as you know, but, I think. Yeah. But um, Jerry was, you know, a very talented man. And, uh, you know, he wasn't uh, everyone's choice, I think, as a person, because he was, he was a bit brittle. And he, he didn't know, he, he took a bit of getting on with sometimes. But uh, undoubtedly very talented mm. and very determined and quite ambitious. And, uh, well, like you were, I guess. Exactly. Well, I think we came from a similar background in as much that we were from poor families, if you like, or we like to consider ourselves middle class, but we weren't. I mean, uh, I, th I think my dad, he was a tool maker. Uh, and in those days, no one earned more than about 10 quid a week, you know, 10 pounds a week, which was a lot more than a lot of other people were earning. So we considered ourselves a bit cut above the rest. But my dad was... Um, bit of a loner, as I'm a bit of a loner, really. But he was very supportive of me. He was a Scotsman. Never, ever did anything in the home, in the house. <laughs> Never did any painting or any do-it-yourself and all that stuff. And he was a Scotsman in that sense. And uh, I had a very, very good mother. Didn't appreciate her fully until many years later. Mm. Realised what a wonderful woman she was. But uh, I guess that's pretty common with most people. Yeah, absolutely. And were they supportive of your career path? Oh, proud. My mother was so proud. It used to embarrass me. She would introduce me to friends and all that. And she was so, so proud of me that I used to cringe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you met Dad when you were a sound editing. Where was that? And can you, do you have any memories of first meeting him? What was he like? What was he doing? No, we weren't. It's funny enough, the, the film had dissolved in a way because... You know of people, you work in the same studio as they are, you don't always get to know them that well. And you are like passing ships in the night, really, because you do one film in one place, and you go to Hammersmith, for instance, then you go to Riverside Studios, then you go to Nettlefold Studios, then Twickenham, then you go somewhere else, and you meet these people either on their way out or their way in. So I didn't really get to know Jerry very well until much later, of course. And then when we were at Pinewood, I was doing the Bonds, I used to bump into him quite regularly. And we'd pass the time of day and what have you. And we, we didn't become friends until much later when he was doing uh, the Space Precinct series. And uh, I got a call from him one day and uh, he rang me and he said, can you recommend a director? And I'd just finished the Bonds and I'd done one or two other films and and I was, you know, I wasn't exactly in great demand at that time, believe it or not. And uh, Jerry said, uh, 
can you recommend a director? And I said, uh, what about me? And he said, would you do it? I said, yeah, of course I would. I'll come down and see. So I popped down and to do a pilot for Jerry, which is the pilot, of course, is very important. Mm. It's the first episode that goes out, if you like. So, you know, if people like it, then they'll watch the rest of the series, hopefully. So I came in, I shot the pilot, and uh, I went on to do, I think, six or seven others there. Mm -hmm. And I was probably there for a year or so. And uh, I got on very well with Jerry, and uh, he used to re rely on me a bit, I think, you know, uh, with for, you know, I suppose I was probably the most experienced well, I don't know about the most experienced director he had. He used quite a lot of experienced directors, but, uh, you know, he was very open to ideas. And what I liked about Jerry was he would always give young people a chance. Mm. Not that I was young, but the musician, for instance, you know, was someone that no one had ever heard of. And Jerry was so enthusiastic to encourage him to do the music on the series. Yeah. And he was like that with a lot of people on the series. He was, he was, he liked loyalty. He liked, it's funny enough, it was very similar to Cubby Broccoli in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know, Cubby Broccoli came from a, an Italian-American family, and loyalty is very important to, yes. to those families. And uh, that's what um, Cubby loved. He loved people to be loyal, and he, were, he was very much loved. And I think Jerry also, you know, appreciated people being loyal to him. And, uh, you know, you... You just enjoyed working in that atmosphere. It yeah. makes you relax, and I think you do your best work in that atmosphere. Yeah, in a kind of collaborative, yeah. creative family type yeah, environment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, there was you know there plenty of people who worked with him for thirty plus years mm -hmm. who came back for Space Breezing. Mm -hmm. Since you brought us on Space Breezing, John, what were your impressions of that series coming to it? Because you were involved from pretty early on. Well, it was it was unusual. It was. <laughs> You know, part of the space thing, I think, that you know, the Star Wars thing was happening and, you know, people were trying to do uh, futuristic series and the idea was extremely good. And, uh, you know, he cast some very good people in America and so it could be sold, I suppose, in America, basically. And um, the scripts were excellent and uh, I quite enjoyed... I was in new territory, you know, and uh, I always remember Jerry he had a bit of a problem with studio space at Pinewood. So he took one of the sound stages and he, he made it have a second floor. So we used to have to move the stuff up via an improvised elevator onto the second floor to continue shooting the scenes. It was the only way we could build the sets, you know, to have uh, like a two two story stage, which yeah. is really very unusual. And, uh, yeah, he was sort of, he was very innovative and uh, in his ideas, mm. and I enjoyed that. And uh, there was a nice family atmosphere on the series. And how were uh, Ted Shackleford and Rob Youngblood to work with? They were very, very good, particularly in the early part of the series, towards the end of the series. I think when they knew that the series wasn't going to be renewed... I think Ted began to be a little less enchanted with the English, <laughs> the English way of life, shall we say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he got injured on one occasion. We used to use these, um, you know, bullet effects and uh, we used to put these little explosive devices into the woodwork and get the actors to run through and then we'd explode the, these devices to appear like bullet hits and hopefully not, all the bits of splinters of wood and that came out, hopefully would miss the actors. But on one occasion, Ted got hit in the, uh, on the eyebrow, with the, or on the, just above the eyebrow, with a splinter. And uh, that rather upset him. And, uh, you know, in those days we didn't have CGI, or it was just starting. And um, so, you know, nowadays you, you just don't do that. You just put them in afterwards, but... In those days, we used all this. Everything was done for real, if you like. And uh, on the Bond films, we used them hugely. You can imagine it. And they're always exaggerated on a Bond film. You know, I mean, if you put a bullet hit in snow, you wouldn't get anything come out. But we, it was like a, a three-inch mortar going off when <laughs> when when we did bullet hits in the snow. It's the only way you could make it exciting. You yeah. Know? So you know, a lot of my 
experience probably doing action on the Bond films came into play with my thinking on Space Precinct. Yeah. You can really clearly see your kind of action influence. Mm-hmm. The aliens, the prosthetics and that sort of thing, did that, was that a challenge? Oh, it was, it was a pain, actually. <laughs> I mean, those poor actors uh, having to put those prosthetics on, you know, a two-hour two hour makeup job, and then you're in this plastic in the heat of the studio lights, and then they had to act on top of that. <laughs> it was a difficult job. And then they did it very well. I really never complained, or very rarely. And, um, yeah, we, we had a good experience with the actors. and There were some very good actors there. I used, even used a couple from uh, that I'd used on the Bond movies, a couple of the actors. They yeah, were good friends of mine. I said, come on, uh, come on, uh, we can't pay you any money, but um, <laughs> or very little money. And just out of friendship, they would come along and work for me on on the film so it was good so is, is some of that uh, sort of star casting down to you then is it Cause you had Stephen Burkhoff yes. and Francis Barber and yeah. Ray Winston that's right it's well, really interesting yeah, names yeah certainly uh, Burkhoff he was a friend of mine and uh, I'd used him in Octopussy he was fantastic in Octopussy he played the Relegate General and he was well over the top we had this huge huge set it's supposed to be in the Kremlin the war room with a revolving podium with all the, the president on and we had a look alike for Brezhnev and what have you and um, Stephen Burkhoff was pointing out the weakness you know how how the uh, the West was decadent and weak well they weren't far wrong there were they <laughs> And uh, so forth, and uh, he was way over the top. And of course, all the actors then then took their cue from him, and they went over the top. And I always remember Elaine Straight, the continuity came at me. She said, "You've got to come down. They're terrible. They're over the top." I said, "This is a Bond movie, you know. You've got to make a statement." So I I, I went along with it largely, and uh, that's the great thing about the Bond films. You you need to. Go over the top of it in, in what you do, you know. It's, it's, it's a license to do that, the Bond movies. And, uh, they're very extravagant films. Big time. So yeah. I'm sure this is well documented, John, but just for, for me and listeners who don't know, how does one, how did you make the leap from editor to directing Bond? It's quite a, quite a jump. It was, it was probably one of the biggest surprises in the film industry. <laughs> Everyone was so surprised when I got the gig on For Your Eyes Only, including myself, <laughs> more so myself. Cubby Broccoli had been um, in America for two or three years, and uh, there was a sort of a pause in making the Bond films. And then he separated from Harry Saltzman. MGM bought Harry Saltzman's share of the franchise, and then Cubby came back and we were all very excited to think that maybe we'd get a job on the film. Anyway, I got an invitation to go down to have lunch with Cubby at um, Pima Studios and we sat at his round table in the window there in the restaurant. And uh, there was Peter Lamont, myself, Derek Meddings, all the key people who had worked on the previous films were there. And we had a lovely lunch and... I think Derek said, who's going to be the new Bond? And he said, oh, it might be this or that. And then, of course, Derek said, uh, Derek Meddins, who worked with Jerry for so many years, brilliant, brilliant, absolute brilliant man. And uh, he turned around, he said, who's going to direct it? And uh, Cubby said, oh, I don't know, it might be Guy Hamilton. It might be we'll do this and that. And he he quoted quite a few names. And then Derek, turned around he said what about me meaning Derek and there was a kind of an embarrassed sort of laughter went round the table and uh, that quickly changed the subject to something else anyway two weeks went by and I got another call to go and have lunch with Cubby and this time it was just Cubby his wife uh, Michael Wilson and myself at the table and I thought this is a bit odd (laughs) And sure enough, he said, uh, after the very nice lunch, he said, um, I'd like you to come back to the office. 
So I said, I'll go and wash my hands and I'll join you in the office. And when I went there, they were all gathered around his desk and they all looked at me and uh, Cubby said, uh, how would you like to direct the next Bond film? Well, my legs nearly gave way from underneath me. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And he said, well, if you need time to think about it, I said, no, 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 I don't need any time to think about it, you know. So that was the, that was my, uh, that's how I was hired, if you like. And uh, he said, I have to pass it by MGM, and the new 50% owners, he said, but I, I'll, I'll sort that out. And uh, MGM were going through a bit of a transition, as they always seem to be in some, one crisis or another. And... Uh, Whatever he did, he was very persuasive, and whatever he did, he cleared it with MGM. And uh, I became the director of uh, For Your Eyes Only. And uh, <laughs> funnily enough, uh, Derek Medins came in with me as uh, my visual effects man, and he was absolutely brilliant. He'd been on the Moonraker, of course, before that, and Spy Who Loved Me. On my recommendation, I haste to add, oh. I recommended uh, Derek. Lewis Gilbert said, I haven't made a film in England for some years. He said, you know, who does this and who does what? And I said, well, Derek is a fantastic chap. You've got to use him. So that's how Derek got into the bonds. Because yeah. I was working with Lewis in Paris. That's how I got in back into them again. I mean, I did on the Majesty's Secret Service in 1969, and there was like a seven or eight year gap. And Guy Hamilton came in and did some films, and he brought his own people in. A uh, guy, guy was a lovely man, actually. I, I got to know him later on. Um, but he, he, like a lot of directors, he didn't like second units. He liked to do the whole film, everything himself. Quite different to me. Um, <laughs> I used to encourage. I used to have three or four units, and <laughs> I would design the sequences. But uh, if I could get someone else to shoot them, I would. You know, you were a delegator, John. I was a delegator. <laughs> And that was my secret of my success, really, to be quite honest. I used to design a storyboard, all the action scenes. I'd, I'd actually invent the action scenes and draw them up in a very crude fashion. And then I would employ a um, storyboard artist to enhance my rough sketches. And then I'd post all the pictures all around the room of my office and the actors would come in and I'd enthuse them with all these these action scenes and... It worked very well. In fact, I used one of your dad's storyboard artists or art director. Well, how lovely. Yeah. That's a good place to cut it, though, because yeah. what John says next was mm. very cool. I didn't know it. I mm. think a lot of you won't know it either. <gasps> it may even be an exclusive. Well, well. Probably not, because there aren't many things that really aren't known anymore. Yeah. But, but it was great. So get ready for pod 64 absolutely You're going to love what john says next to be continued how great <laughs> oh that's really nice i mean john is there's all sorts of interviews with him all over the internet of course mm. about his bond association very little about his jerry anderson association so it's really nice to hear that from him exactly really well obviously we cover bond stuff too yeah. and we cover more bond stuff next week as yeah, well lovely. and uh you know stuff about how john got various jobs and that kind of stuff it's just really interesting to hear yeah so uh, thank you to John for having me over and uh, and telling me all that stuff and yes. we've got lots more to look forward to next week absolutely yeah that's lovely um, Richard how's it going with your uh, potential interviewees you've got lined up well <laughs> I, I, I mean that's rather embarrassing isn't it as you know about to spend a few days away in the country with lots of people one of whom is Beth Chalmers uh, of Big Finish fame Terra Hawks uh, audio series fame uh, has also played, I think, um, a companion to Sylvester McCoy, the Seventh Doctor, in uh, in a few of them and uh, various oh. other bits and pieces. So I shall try and um, spend some time with her and yeah, try and get an interview together. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it, from a voice actor's point of view? I haven't yeah. had any of those. Aside from that, I've not yet heard from uh, Wendy Craig or or Ross Kemp or, <laughs> or, Ross Kemp or uh, Chris Barry. Chris Barry or somebody else wasn't there as well. <laughs> Chris Rear, Timmy Mallet, I don't know. Tim Brooke Taylor, he's local. I could ask him. Yeah, great. If you say as well. Okay, fine. Well, look, I've got one recorded with Ray Earl, which will yeah. be in pod 65 and 66. Great. Uh, she's a writer and creator of my Mad Fat Diary and working on CBBC shows currently. She loves mm -hmm. Captain Scarlet. And I've got some more archive stuff coming up in the next few months as well. Yeah, always nice to hear. And uh, hoping to do some Space 1999 related stuff too. Of course, yeah. So it's all very exciting. Now, also in a few weeks' time... Mm -hmm. We will be featuring a drama tease, an audio drama tease, where oh. we, we will be giving you the first 15-ish minutes 
of the new Space 1999 audio drama Breakaway. Oh, lovely. So that will replace our regular feature in a few weeks' time. Great. Be the first time you get to hear that in its uh, all its glory, and it yeah. sounds marvellous. Yeah, yeah. So you can nice. look forward to that. And many more to come. Also, if you've got any suggestions of interviewees and all that sort of stuff, then do tweet us. How do they tweet us, Richard? Well, you can hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast, or you can tag I'm Jamie Anderson or me, Richard N. James, and we'll see your tweets there. Yeah, or post it in the uh, the podcast group or anything like exactly. that. Exactly. And if you happen to have a chum or a neighbour who's a, a famous... A famous, yes. <laughs> then let us know, maybe put us in touch with them. That would be great. You know, yeah. sometimes people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I live next door to uh, Elton John and David Furnish. Or, uh, yeah, that's what they do sometimes, yeah. Something like that. I mean, yeah. that's un- unlikely. Or, uh, you know, oh, Judy Dench is uh, yeah. friends with my yeah. dog groomer. That's or right, big Stingray like, fan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you never know. No, you well, never listen, uh, know. that's right. I mean, I'm spending Christmas with Nigel Planer. I bet he's a Jerry Anderson fan. I bet there he you is. Go. There's one for So you. I shall worm my way in there and try and get an interview out of him. I love that out of context, Richard. Yeah, I'm spending Christmas with Nigel Planer. Well, you know, as you do. Working, I have to say, not in a social capacity. He's not invited me round or anything. It might end up being a social capacity, you never know. <laughs> anyway, we're talking absolute nonsense now, which is uh, fine and is the perfect lead in. To <laughs> it really is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to someone who is not going to speak any nonsense at all. Quite right. But may get stuck watching some. <laughs> <laughs> well recovered. <laughs> yes, it's Chris Dale's amazing randomizer. Show. Tonight, our special guest star is that brilliant British. Uh, 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 j- just a second. So, you really are Swedish? You big horn, dears, dear. Oh, I'd never have guessed. Uh, uh, quick, Chris, uh, what do you do? Oh, hello, Kermit. Well, I have the randomizer right here. Each week, this machine selects a random Jerry Anderson episode, and I, you know, watch along giving my thoughts and opinions and little bits of trivia on each one. How about being a comedian? You know, being funny, telling jokes? Well, it hasn't happened yet, but if I can think of any, then yeah, sure. Oh, good! Uh, but Kermit, Kermit, uh, have you seen my assistant Marina anywhere? She was supposed to meet me here, but I can't find her. I do hope some unforeseen disaster hasn't befallen her. Oh. Woman! 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 <laughs> Guess I spoke too soon. Uh, well, that's a disaster we knew about all along. Ah, well, it does present a problem, actually. I mean, who can I find at such short notice to press the button for us today? Chrissy! Chrissy, I'm coming! Oh, whoa, Miss Piggy, hello. Oh, Christopher, you great big beautiful honk you. <sighs> <laughs> yes, um, uh, do you need your eyes tested or something? What? Uh, <laughs> Go along with this or I'll cut you in half. <laughs> um, yes, please, by all means, make the selection for us today. Oh, I'm starting to regret bringing my act on this show. Assuming anyone actually wants to see it. We'd love to see your act. In fact, we'd hate to miss your act. In fact, we'd love to hate your act. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, guys, okay. So anyway, getting back to the point, um, what do we have today? Oh, well, an interesting choice, Miss Piggy. <laughs> Yes, a series we haven't seen for a while, actually. We're joining Mike Mercury and Beaker. Me, 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 me. No, not you, Beaker, the other Beaker. His supercar. Pity we can't book an important guest star on this show. So we're back with Supercar, and right away... You may notice that things have changed around here. We have a new version of the uh, Supercar theme tune. This is performed by the... Mike Sam Singers, I think, who would later be back to do the theme for the Secret Service. And um, I'm not sure what I feel about this this version of the song. I think the one in the first season was, you know, very heroic, very stirring. This one is is jazzier and more playful, but it's also slightly cheesy. It is a much more a sort of happy, jolly uh, kiddie show than perhaps it was previously. But we're now in the second season of Supercar. In fact, I think this is the penultimate episode of the entire series. Transatlantic Cable. Was there ever a less thrilling title for an episode of anything? The Atlantic Ocean lies a multi-core telephone cable. (gasps) Its length, believe it or not, is 3,400 nautical miles. I don't believe it. Yeah, this is another feature of the uh, second season of Supercar. Back and forth from America to Great Britain. We often opened with a narrator. Much vital information could be obtained. 
You're Mr. Shackleton, that's just fine. And I was never clear on whether this narrator was actually meant to be Mike Mercury or if it was just Graydon Gould doing a very similar voice. I suppose it was meant as a an easy way to sort of give the audience a bit of uh, vital information at the start of an episode. One moment, Master Spy. Hurry, friend Zarin. I can't wait to satisfy our first customer. Oh, and here we find that uh, Master Spy and Zarin have tapped the transatlantic cable, stealing some vital information here. And another of um, the second season changes to supercar is, is notable in this scene. We now have Cyril Shapps. Phone Mr. Simmons. Tell him that the English company is proposing to charge $200,000. In the role of Master Spy, replacing George Marcel. Um, it's quite a few changes to the second season, even though it is, you know, it is the same show. There are quite a few differences that almost make it feel like... It's going to work, Master Spy. ...like a different show entirely. All the money we're going to make. Yes, friend Zarin. We have the Although Zarin is still his... Uh, usual toadying self, so that's right. And we can never, ever be caught. I bet they're going to end up getting caught. It's just a feeling. And I think the supercar team might have something to do with it as well. I can't imagine what the Tele Cable Corporation would want to see Mike about. Oh, he's got a massive bill coming his way by the sound of it. So for the second season, several of the puppets were, if not re-sculpted, they had a bit of facial work done on them. Um, Professor Popkiss seems to have a, a swollen chin. Um, Beaker's head seems a bit smaller. Uh, Mike, however, seems more or less the same as he always did. Which is reassuring. Oh, like, like, oh, oh no. I thought I'd come up and meet you. Uh, oh, no, you man. didn't do us any favours by doing that. Please I go away, well. you're quite ugly. What is Supercar doing in New York, Master Spy? If you will have the patience to wait a few moments, I might be able to tell you. Mm. Oh, Master S Supercar just land happened to land on top of the building that's just, just over I the road from Master Spy and Zarin. I called in Mike Mercury. It's so convenient. Perhaps he will find out how we are doing this. You blithering idiot. Oh, come on, you've nothing to fear from Mike Mercury. It's not like he hasn't caught you at least ten times by now and always let you go. You are nothing but a cheap imitation of a man. Do you suppose? Oh, don't say that to Zarin. He's still the original Zarin. You're not the original. Although I do like you. I do like Cyril Shapps. Cyril Shapps is brilliant. I'm, I'm just looking at this scene now watching... Um, Oh, poor old no. Zarin has been trembling and now he's just fallen backwards into a chair. Even though the puppets themselves right. often but look very, very crude in this show. We've ever done in Supercar, Mr. Bell is easy. There are some really nice moments of the puppetry itself, character character moments like that coming through in the puppetry. There goes a nice guy. <laughs> okay, if you say so. Well, he is a nice guy, but uh, very unnecessary comment. Are you all right? Returning to base. Black Rock, here I come. I was never entirely clear on the point in the series in which um, the Supercar's team started being hired for missions. Right. I'll give you a rundown on the situation. A telephone. But now we're getting a proper American mission radio. briefing with. Uh, it runs under the Atlantic Ocean. With Mike, complete with a map here. and a little pointing stick. And crosses for the ocean until it connects up with Great Britain. Here, but the telephone company has asked us to investigate. And this is just what we're going to do. <laughs> oh, what would they have done if, if Supercar hadn't existed? They would have had to have gone out there and actually had a look themselves. Yeah, I agree, Professor. That would never do. What do they say? They say they are ready for Supercar and that there is nothing to worry about. Good, friend Zarin. I have now, one of the reasons I feel the second series of Supercar is um, not only very different from the first, but kind of a bit of a step down, to be honest, is the first... Oh, they glued some sort of flashlight to the top of Supercar. Um, the first season was more or less entirely written by uh, a pair of writers, two brothers, Martin and Hugh Woodhouse. And they are the ones who brought a lot of the sort of technical detail, particularly to the dialogue, but they also really understood what made the characters work. Um, I think they are responsible for Beaker being the sort of breakout star of the show. For whatever reason, and nobody really knows quite why, um, it just seems to have been a sudden and total 
uh, ab um, end of communication between them and the Andersons, but they weren't invited back for the second season, and instead, every single episode, all 13, in the second series of Supercar, were written by Jerry and Sylvia themselves. And... Without ever, ever Thank wanting to um, criticize Jerry and Sylvia, right, they're writing the on this now. show. Okay, Doc. And you too, Jimmy. In the second right. season, is very much for that of a children's show. Right, Mike. Okay, Mike. Whereas the Woodhouse brothers, I think they were pitching more at the same level that Thunderbirds ultimately was. Of you know, a lot of kids are going to be watching this. Let's be fair, mostly kids. But this is a family show, and we need stuff in there for the adults as well. I don't think Jerry and Sylvia quite got that. Their priority seemed to be, first and foremost, this is a children's show. I think you can see that in the, the handful of episodes that they wrote for the first season. Um, they seem to be a bit more child-oriented and generally kind of weaker. And it, I, it may be that if the Woodhouses hadn't worked on this show, I wouldn't be saying that. I would have, you know, just watched 26 episodes written by Jerry and Sylvia and I wouldn't have noticed a difference. But in the second series, I think you do notice their absence. And I'm also just staring at Supercar as it goes into a dive and I'm wondering why the S on the side seems to have turned into a reverse C, pointing the wrong way. I don't know what that's about. Keep your eyes open for that cable. It can't be far away. Right, Mike. Okay, Mike. Oh. Mitch, you look too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. We brought the monkey along on this highly experimental and uh, potentially dangerous underwater mission. And the boy actually come to think of it. We didn't need either of them. How, how, how does it take four people? Nothing yet. To track down a length of cable that runs like, well, from the U.S. to the U.K. There it is. Oh, good boy, Jimmy. Oh, Here we, we go. did need Jimmy. Oh, brilliant, super, fantastic. Jimmy saved the day again. Right. Now all we have to do is follow the cable and see if any part of it has been tampered with. Okay, Mike. Oh, this is going to be a long episode, isn't it? Lord, okay, we'll to follow. And you should recognise that music as uh, being reused in Thunderbirds. I want to say, alias Mr. Hackenbacker. Ooh, a sunken ship. What well, interesting things might be lurking in a sunken ship. Are we going to look at the sunken ship? Please, let's have something interesting happen. Throttling back. Uh, where? Where, Jimmy? Uh, where? Oh, come where? on. Why are you writing it as Jimmy is the only observant one who can see the blooming obvious? Yes. Very sad. Very sad. It hey, is. It's like very sad. Of the merchant vessel that was sunk during the last war. Yeah, there must be dozens of wrecks like that around here. Oh, well. Let's continue the search. But Dr. Baker, Mike, you don't understand. And again, we have a very early... Uh, sequence of a fish tank being put in front of the, the puppet stage. And this one I'm noticing there's lots of like little bits of plant and other sort of I tell you I saw a light in one of the cabins. Underwater detritus kind of floating around. It, it again adds so much to making it real. Big boy now you know there aren't any such things as ghosts. I think maybe we've done enough searching for today. Oh come on, you guys never used to be this dim. Heard what the skipper said to We're returning to base. So let's hear no more of it. Full boost horizontal. Yes, Jimmy, you can't come down here looking for something and then claim that we found it. That's just not on. Again, what is with the S on the side of supercar, supercar there? It is just like a no present luck, meme shape. Returning to Black Rock. Roger, Mike. I will prepare something for you all to eat. Has Jimmy ruined everything for you again? <laughs> I understand. It happens. Oh, but Jimmy did see something on the ship. So that's our, that was our thrilling uh, advert break cliffhanger. A light was You're a fool, on. Johnson. Yeah. Well, we succeeded, didn't we? We made it watertight, repaired the airlocks, got all the supplies and oxygen we need. And now we've caught each other up on who we are and what we're doing exactly. down here. Exactly. We could work here weeks undetected. But despite our echo sounding equipment, you were unable to detect supercar until it was right on top of us. I'm sure they saw the light in the cabin window. I don't think so. 
Unless they had a hyper-intelligent small boy with them, which is very unlikely. From a laboratory in Philadelphia about a new drug they're working on. And this is a story that, again, is very much of its time. This would never... Go on your own, Johnson. I want to work today. This would never even make sense today. Just in case, supercar. All these messages on this one telephone cable. I'm staring at this, um... I'll be sending a message to one of these bad guys on the ship here. The one with the slightly squashed head. I'm sure I recognize him from somewhere. We'll intercept telephone call as requested. We'll report back to you. And this is very unusual as well for Master Spy and Zarin to have other people doing their own dirty work for them. It happened a couple of times in the second series, but it, it's always much more fun when they're actually out there making a nuisance for themselves. Although I suppose Master Spy wouldn't really want to uh, be stuck on, an, on a sunken ship with Zarin for... Gosh, how long have these two guys been stuck down here? Nobody knows. Nobody really cares. The vaguely familiar guy has put on a diving suit. He's going out to do something. I don't know. Not, not, not very exciting. This one, I've got to say. I thought the title "Transatlantic Cable" might offer all sorts of dramatic possibilities, but alas, we're being uh, we're being a bit shortchanged here. As I was saying, so far we found nothing. Yeah, other than the uh, shipwreck, of course. But I of course, you, Mike, where those uh, people very obviously the are not. A light? What, coming from the cabin of a shipwreck? Surely, Jimmy, you didn't really believe that you saw that, did you? Professor, I've never told a lie in my life. I mean, I know I don't like Jimmy, but to be fair, he's not one usually one for making up. As he says, he's not one for making but up perhaps stories. Perhaps uh, you imagined it, Jimmy. Uh, and that oh, God, you, you're not still on this kick if he imagined it. You're not usually this, um... Mitch saw the light. Mitch, you saw the light. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you're not going to bring in the monkey as your, um... <laughs> your support witness, are you? There you are. He did see it. Oh, see, well, if the monkey me. says so... I, um, I must confess I'm beginning to think... Uh, there might be something in it after all. I mean, I have absolutely no regard for your opinions or views on anything, Jimmy, but if the monkey says there was a light, yeah. hmm, perhaps it is worth investigating after all. And find that this shipwreck is, in fact, the base for the frogmen that are tapping the cable. Oh, God, we're back to the map. I have a scheme uh, that will require making a new attachment for supercar. And um, as it is uh, getting late, I would suggest that you all get some sleep and by morning, I will have the attachment ready. Gee, I'll stay up and help you, Dr. Baker. No, oh, Jimmy, no, that's okay, Jimmy, really. I, I, I can manage. I that we all go to bed and leave Dr. Baker to work on his own. Then in the morning, Mike and I can go in supercar. You can look after the console. Oh, and look at you, Baker mister. I'm going to have a ride in supercar. Right. Don't you know that your place is sat behind the control console? You never get to go anywhere. Don't pad your part out, Professor. Oh, and I like the model of Black Rock Charging Lab that board. they built for Five, the second season. Oh, seven, Beaker's just mounted a great big drill nine, on the front of Supercar. Okay. Eleven. They basically 13, just replaced the, the spiky bit 14, that was already there with a twisty 15, spiky bit. Yeah, I really like the Black Rock model. It's um because I think in the first season it was just Black Rock was a painting in the very first episode, and then in the second season they actually built the model for it. Which of course you see destroyed in the uh, opening credits of Thunderbirds. Very end when that, that well, refinery or whatever it is blows up, work, just on the like. bottom right ish yeah, so middle I'm of the frame, there's Black Rock going up in flames. I've got an idea, Mr. Smarty Mercury is paying us another visit. I suppose maybe things like this must have gone on in real life. Position um, 2X, but I can't imagine any of it was particularly. Professor, this is it. Interesting. Here we go. Um, I can hear engines. I can hear engines approaching. Can you hear engines approaching? Quick, put out the lights. Mm. No light coming from any of the cabins, though, Mike. Well, like I told you, Jimmy imagined it. I can't but the, the monkey! The evidence of the monkey, Mike! And I don't know why I'm using the Beaker voice. Beaker isn't in this scene, but the monkey's testimony is absolutely rock solid, Mike. We're wasting our time. Let's do just that. The result may be rewarding. Full boost horizontal. 
we might crash, but uh, you know, it, it, it might be rewarding. I've never crashed before. We've gone. We'll give them another few moments and then put the lights on again. Oh, you fiends! Ah, but Mike and Popkiss have outsmarted them. They've arrived again without their engines running. <sighs> cunning, very cunning. Let's just wait a few moments, Mike. Yeah, let's wait. We haven't done enough of that in this episode. Mike, look! Yeah. So Jimmy was right. I'd never have believed it. All right. <laughs> Oh, you have such a low opinion of Jimmy, don't you? I love it. Now all we have to do is get them out of there. And thanks to Beaker, that's going to be dead easy. Emergency Priming charge. torpedoes. Well, that was a close one. Yeah. yeah something nearly happened back there. We sure, we sure soon to that. Soon short of that. I can't even say my words. I don't think we'll see supercar here again. No, no, no supercar. What's that coming towards us? Oh, it's only a supercar. With a great big corkscrew drill bit on the front. What was that? It's supercar! Oh, no! Another pair of quivering puppets now as the... Oh, the drill bit okay, has um, entered the cabin. Now all we've got to do is back away. So they're going to flood they the two guys out. You're going to be flooded out! There's only one thing we can do. We've got to get out, quick! Getting out? Oh, yeah, okay. You could do that, I suppose, yeah. I mean, okay, your other alternative is drowning. Kevin must be filling up with water pretty fast. Or you All could try to plug the hole. It's, it's not that big, That's actually. That's it, Mike. And whoever is in there will be leaving the cabin very shortly. Oh, don't give us the dramatic, exciting music. It's not... They're leaving the ship one by one. Come on. Do something. I guess Jimmy was right. Yes, Mike. And the transatlantic telephone cable will never be tapped again. Well, by the time supercars... Unless are, somebody like tries the exact same thing ride. elsewhere, Bull which is uh, a possibility. You said there are lots of other sunken ships they can use as bases. Um, oh, I was going to say, presumably you are going to go up and catch the guys. You have... Yeah. And you've tied them up, tied them together and just dumped them in the laboratory. And okay. I must give you a new credit, Jimmy. Uh, you were right about the light in the cabin. Yes, I would Jimmy. never have believed never it possible uh, that you could be useful, Jimmy. Okay. I guess I know now how George Washington felt. We need to convince him that like George Washington, we cannot tell a lie. Oh, hello? Is that the Mastermind Information Service? I love I that like um, the, the supercar team have their we'll arch enemy's phone Sarah number the and they can just table. call them up for a gloat. That's so sweet. Master Spy. That's very what supercar as well. Your idea. No, no, no. Your, so your as the police idea. arrive to presumably arrest Master Spy and Zarin, uh, that is actually the last we see of them in supercar, believe it or not. And that was Transatlantic Cable. Well, there are worse episodes of Supercar, but not too many. Um, again, it, it, it's a very sort of old... F I was going to say it's an old-fashioned idea, but then this is a very old series anyway. So at the time, this may have seemed like you know, revolutionary and, uh, and uh, highly original, but now I think it's probably aged so much that the... The idea of the story is just so so irrelevant to us looking back at it now. Um, yeah, there are there are worse supercars, not many, but oh, this was a dull one. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I'm never a huge fan of supercar just because it's one of the ones it doesn't have the timeless quality of Stingray or Thunderbird yeah. Scarlet. Yeah, I don't think that's down to the black and whiteness, but it's interesting what Chris said about about Dad and Sylvia taking over from Martin and Hugh Woodhouse on the right. Right, right. And how how far into of, the show was that? Well, for, for the second season onwards. I they, see. They, but they kind of, they aged it down a bit. Right. And I think Chris's analysis there is right, that Martin and Hugh knew how to write for kids and adults. Yeah. Whereas at that stage, they really, obviously, Dad saw this as a real kids show, so they wrote it for kids. Yeah. And that was probably the point at which they must have realised, oh, maybe this isn't working quite so well. Yes. And they kind of reset their sights 
okay. to reach the sort of writing style of Thunderbirds, where it really was written on, on yeah. two levels. Yeah, so an, a really important part of the journey is Absolutely, creators. a lesson learned. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, how interesting. I don't know Supercar at all. I've yet to see an episode, so I must um, try and dig one out and, and have a look. But just not that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not that one. Transatlantic oh. Cable, probably one of the worst ones. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go and watch some of the, the first series. It's It's okay. Yeah, all right. And obviously, Richard, you do bear a striking resemblance to it, the hero it, pilot Mike Mercury. It has been said. I don't mind that. He's quite a yeah, dish. Well, yeah, you're Mike Mercury and I'm Moid from Terrorhawks. I think I know <laughs> yeah. which one I'd rather be, to be honest. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, uh, oh. uh, Richard, I've got my quick fire five. Oh, well done. Right, finally. Now, they're not very good and they're hastily scribbled down in Sharpie, so let's hope I can still read them. Uh, no, this isn't going very well. I can't read the can't uh, read that one. Right, first next one. What does that? Oh, okay. So slightly over the top baddies. Right. Doctor Aegon from Lavender Castle or Master Spy from Supercar. Master Spy from Supercar. <laughs> if you had to have a toy Thunderbird two, Dinky or Corgi? Oh, Dinky or Corgi Thunderbird two, Corgi. <laughs> okay. Mm. Ugly alien menaces. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, or possibly under sea. Undersea Overlord Titan or Outer Space Creepy Space Witch Zelda? Oh, it's got to be Zelda. And these last two are song related. Right, I have to say, this isn't very quick fire, Jamie. Slow Fire 5 continues. <laughs> we we'll just have to extend the music bed out a bit. Yes. <laughs> Not Very Good Songs by Barry right. Gray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Torch of the Battery Boy uh, yeah. or Flying High, the unused Thunderbirds outro. Oh, yes, Flying High, having heard that, yes. And awesome songs by Barry Gray. Uh huh. Fireball XL Fives. I wish I was a spaceman. Yeah. Or Stingray's Aquamarina. Oh, I wish I was a spaceman for me. Yeah, good choice. Yeah. Nice. There you go, Richard. You made well it done. to your uh, slow fire five yeah. from me. <laughs> well, you did very well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tr- I'll try better next time. Yeah, yeah. Hard. You know, it might help just to have them, you know, ready in advance next I just time. Forgot. I forgot. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Anyway, that is the end of the randomizer. That's the end of the quickfire fire. That's the end of all the feature sections of this podcast, which That's means it. we must be coming to the end of this week's Jerry Anson podcast, Pod 63, Richard. I think you must be right, Jamie. Yeah, I think that's <sighs> it. In the can, as they say. Phew, as you keep saying, even though there's no can. <laughs> yeah. So please do make sure that you have subscribed now and that you review us. And really, please do now go and share it with a friend. Because, yeah. you know, this is literally the best Jerry Anson podcast in the world, in yeah. the universe, in fact. Yeah, that's right. That's true. You know, top five in the TV and film charts. Yes, and many podcasts. people, when they saw that news, would say, well, how do we get to number one? Well, we're telling you how to get to number one. Yeah, by share sharing us. it. Yeah. We, we need to reach new people, and we hope yeah. they might possibly enjoy a couple of minutes of a podcast. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That'd be nice. So, yeah, let's hope for some new listeners next week. Yeah, that'd be and some old ones, ones too. <laughs> no, we love <laughs> no, our no, old podsterons. No, 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 I mean, no, our podsterons. <laughs> yeah, do drop us a line. Podcast at jerryanson.co.uk. We'd love to hear your audio files, podsterons, if you would yeah. like to say something and have the world of Jerry Anson hear you. Mm. And pop us an audio file, record it on your phone, send it into the email address, and uh, we might pay it out. Yeah, that'd be lovely. But until Pod 64, we'll say goodbye. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. One complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green. I'm feeling a bit mean for wow. um, cutting the John Glenn thing short and making them come back next week. No. It is cool, isn't it? Yeah, treat them mean and keep them keen, Jamie. Is that is that where we're going wrong? <laughs> no, that's where, we, that's where we should be going. That's right, yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. That's nice. It was a really lovely little reveal, that. Yeah, good. So, well Excellent. worth it. You got any reveals, Richard, which you'd like to uh, let us know? Not that I'd like to share right out? now, no. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't want to reveal anything right now because people are listening.
Okay, fine. Well, I've got a top secret thing, which obviously listeners will yeah. want to to hear, and the fact right. that I've listened past the end titles is good. Yeah. So, you know the thing that we've been talking about for the last few weeks with the... Um... What, the thing? Yeah, with the... Well, finally, I've got the... Uh, you have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? <laughs>